Now, Kephrys I came to power in 802 as the usurper against the Empress Irene. He only reigned for nine years and faced two would-be usurpers of his own in the course of that nine-year period. Yet, despite the brevity of his reign and the fact that he never fully established legitimacy, Nikephorus I is one of the most important Byzantine emperors of his era. So today I'd like to take a look at his life and times and talk about how a man can be both an important reformer and be transformed into a human skull cup in just nine years. Let's look at Nikephorus's early life and his origins. Byzantine sources are silent on this point, but the Syriac source Michael the Syrian, along with two Arab sources, Al-Tabari and Masudi, all say that Nikephorus was the descendant of the Ghassanid dynasty. If you'll recall, the Ghassanid kingdom had been destroyed during the Byzantine-Sassanian War of 602-628, and then the ruling house had retreated along with Byzantine forces as they uh, withdrew from the Near East during the Arab invasions and apparently this family had managed to retain its wealth and stature and Nikephorus managed to rise to a position of prominence. At some point during his earlier life, Nikephorus seems to have acquired some military experience. Um, it looks like he was relatively well respected by the military and that would only make sense if he had some experience of his own. So it's possible that he served in the army in some capacity before he became a bureaucrat. Um, in his later career, right before becoming emperor, he was elevated to the office of Logothet. Um, we'll talk about the specifics of that in a minute. But the fact that he got to that office implies that he had quite a bit of bureaucratic experience. And possibly more importantly, he must have had some connections to Irene, since she was relatively notorious for only promoting her own favorites. And um, it should come as no surprise to you that he was also a fairly um, reliable iconophile. Nikephorus' official office was Logothetes to Geneku, and this was the highest level of Logothet, and it made him one of the most powerful bureaucrats in Byzantium. Now, the fact that he held this high office meant that he would have been in fairly regular contact with Irene and all of the other ministers of the government, so he was in a pretty good position to be privy to the conspiracy that eventually overthrew Irene, and it's probable that he could also use his position to gain and retain her trust and, you know, make sure that suspicion didn't come his way. At any rate, his principal responsibility in that office was financial management, which, as you'll recall from our video on Irene, would have been extremely difficult since her policy was to give out massive tax breaks to the wealthy and to also pay off the caliph of the Abbasids in order to buy peace. So between keeping expenditures high and cutting taxes massively, it would have been very difficult for a finance minister to keep things together, especially in an era when there was no such thing as deficit spending. So you can imagine that if the officials who overthrew Irene were disgruntled people who wanted to bring back good government, that Nikephorus would be able to complain the most loudly and the most justifiably. Um, and his office of Logothetes to Geneku would remain one of the most powerful Byzantine offices until the time of the Komnenoi, when the offices of the state began to evolve and change even more, and this office sort of faded into obscurity. The actual title of Logothet eventually becomes more of an honorary thing without any actual functions, but that's still quite a way in the future. Um, anyway, we still don't really know exactly how Nikephorus, um, what his role was in the conspiracy against Irene, but we do know that ultimately he was selected to be the new emperor by the people who were responsible for overthrowing Irene, and that he would have assumed the throne in October of 802. When Nikephorus seized the throne in 802, he inherited a whole world of problems some of which were mostly due to his two immediate predecessors, Irene and Constantine VI, and others of which were due to more long-term factors, such as the Arab invasions. So, speaking of the Arabs, one of the major problems in Nikephorus' time is that Arab forces were able to threaten both Asia Minor and Sicily. Nikephorus was never really able to do much about that, as his focus would be directed elsewhere. He also had a staunch and capable enemy in the First Bulgarian Empire. 
um, this empire was now big enough to thwart any of his ambitions in the Balkans unless it was dealt with, so he would have to spend a lot of his time dealing with the Bulgars. Um, to compound that, the Balkans were mostly lost and had been for a couple centuries, so this was an area where Nikephorus couldn't expect to draw much support, even though he had some ambitions in that area. Now, obviously, one the first challenge that he would have faced is that his empire was more or less bankrupt after Irene's disastrous policies. It's also possible that after five years of reckless military policy and reckless financial policy, that the army was not quite what it could be. Now, five years is not a long time. The institution was probably still mostly sound, but we have to imagine that there was a little bit of slippage in terms of preparation and morale due to possible... Uh, pay shortages or pay cuts that had to happen because of Irene's policies. The icon issue was not actually settled. Now, Irene had restored the icons back in 787, but there were still iconoclasts running around in addition to people who didn't agree on how to keep the icons around. Some people, as we'll see, wanted to go and persecute the iconoclast. And on top of all of that, there's an ongoing legitimacy crisis. Now, Irene had never been accepted, and then when she's usurped, um, that's the, effectively usurping the Asarian dynasty. Um, so Nikephorus now has some enemies, and it turns out that Irene had at least a few supporters who still believed in her, and Nikephorus gets to inherit all of those as well. So, um, to put it lightly, he had his work cut out for him, and his was a reign that was marked by lots and lots of fighting. During his own reign, the emperor Nikephorus managed to maintain peace within the church. However, after his death, some of his successors ran into problems due to, in part, some of the things that Nikephorus had done during his tenure as emperor. So, let's take a look at what Nikephorus did and how that set up the future. So, Nikephorus was an iconophile, but not an extreme one. He wanted to continue Irene's policy of allowing icon worship while not persecuting iconoclasts. This put him in direct conflict with the Zealots, who were iconophiles who wanted to go a step further and punish iconoclasts for what they perceived as their impiety. Nikephorus also found himself at odds with the Zealots because he wanted to uphold the principle that Constantine VI had been trying to establish during the Mechian controversy as to really increase imperial prerogative. So the idea that Nikephorus takes away from the Mechian controversy is that Constantine VI was trying to establish a precedent whereby the emperor could excuse himself from matters of canon law for the purposes of expediency. So if the emperor needed to remarry in order to sire an offspring, then he could break the prohibition against divorce in the interest of the state. And the zealots were not having any of that. They were for strict adherence. However, a faction that would later form, known as the politicians, would support Nikephorus's reading for mostly pragmatic reasons. Um, another lasting legacy of the emperor Nikephorus is that when the elderly patriarch uh, Tiresias died, he appointed patriarch Nikephorus who is not a relation, by the way, to succeed him in 806. And the patriarch Nikephorus would play a fairly large role in the reigns of the emperor Nikephorus's two successors. In 809, Nikephorus had really been butting heads with the leader of the zealots, Theodore of Studium, for several years, and he banished him that year. And it's probably due to this conflict and then the banishment of Theodore of Studium that Nikephorus is portrayed very negatively in the sources, um, and the main source for this period is still Theophanes the Confessor, who is a major zealot and seems to be something of a fanboy of Theodore Studium. So if you're ever wondering why the sources paint Nikephorus in such a black light, well, there you go. Over the course of his reign, Nikephorus faced two challenges from would-be usurpers. The first was from Bardani's Turkus, now, Turkus literally means the Turk, but it was probably actually a reference to a Khazar heritage. And Bardanes had been a major supporter of Irene, and in order to try to win him over, Nikephorus had given him a command in Anatolia. 
and he thought that this would be enough to satisfy Bardanes. However, Bardanes was apparently either loyal to the Empress Irene, or else he was just simply ambitious and he saw the new emperor as vulnerable. So in 803, Bardanes Turkus marched on the capital, but when he failed to attract any popular support, he agreed to retire as a monk, and then later, possibly on Nikephorus' orders, he was blinded. In 808, Arcebor, a patrician, and Keister was at the head of a conspiracy in February of disgruntled officials who wanted to get rid of Nikephorus. Now, as we'll see, Nikephorus was famous for restoring taxes, and it's possible that these were more or less pissed off aristocrats who did not want to pay taxes. Although I don't really know the details of this conspiracy, and I don't think they were ever recorded, but that's just a guess. At any rate, Arcebor failed, and he was also forced to become a monk and ended up being banished to Bithynia. Rulers can't actually accomplish anything without some source of income that is both regular and substantial. So when he became emperor, Nikephorus' first concern was to restore the regular and full collection of taxes and to end the period of laxity that had taken place under Irene. So in, I in Nikephorus' time in the early 9th century, the state's income came primarily from a land tax based on the quantity and quality of each family's agricultural and pastoral lands. There was also an institution at the time called the Alalangian, which had the village community as a whole make up for any default of payment. And the advantage of this is that the state would always be able to get paid, so revenue would always be insured, while it also had the added benefit of making sure that small farmers didn't get dispossessed. Because when small farmers get dispossessed, then that can lead to the consolidation of land under powerful landowners, and then they can pose a challenge to the state's authority and create some other issues, as we'll see much later in Byzantine history. Not to mention that the theme system seems to have really relied heavily on small holders, so this was one way to make sure that the empire continued to have a large number of small farmers. As I've mentioned several times, it is very difficult to really trace the development of Byzantine institutions with any degree of precision between the years 600 and 800 due to the scarcity and relative low quality of the sources that we have available. However, by the time of Nikephorus and possibly up to 200 years before, there was a poll tax called the Kopnikon. And what this tax is, is that it is what is known as a poll tax or a harf tax. And it is due from all of the rural inhabitants of the empire, even those who own no land. So it's basically just a tax that is collected from every family in the empire. And to give you an idea of how far ahead this um, was of its time, even if we take the late date of Nikephorus and say it's like 805 or something like that, um, it still is many centuries ahead of France where they don't have a comparable um, institution until the 1340s, and in Britain it's sometime in the middle of the 17th century. So this is something that is actually a pretty advanced fiscal institution. The Byzantines were also able to collect high tariffs on all imported goods, the collection of which was generally well regulated since goods were funneled into a small number of entry ports that were easy to regulate for imperial officials. So Nikephorus basically restores all of these things. It doesn't look like he really innovated all that much, but the fact that he was able to restore all these things is significant because a lot of times when institutions start to decline, they tend to um, stay defunct because there are a lot of powerful interests which are against them getting started again. So um, Nikephorus uh, was able to do this, and it's possible that at least one of the usurpers who tried to overthrow him was trying to bank on an elite counterreaction to this restoration of taxation. Charlemagne had declared himself to be the Emperor of the Romans on Christmas Day of 800, and he had been trying ever since to get the Byzantines to recognize the legitimacy of his claim. He had proposed marriage to the Empress Irene, but her overthrow made that avenue now unfeasible. So his new plan was to get this recognition from the new Emperor Nikephorus. In order to put pressure on Nikephorus, Charlemagne started to exert pressure against Byzantine holdings in Italy 
and made activity north of the Danube, which kind of let the Byzantines know how powerful he was and that he was capable of doing damage. And this activity north of the Danube really lit a fire in Nikephorus, and we'll talk about what his reaction was. Um, as for Nikephorus himself, he had come to power on a wave of disapproval of Irene's possible marriage to Charlemagne and general disapproval of all things Irene. And he had initially resisted Charlemagne's um, demands, and his response was to actually focus heavily on enhancing Byzantine strength in the Balkans, lest Charlemagne get any ambitions about conquering Eastern Europe. So let's now discuss the so-called Pax Nikephori, the Peace of Nikephorus, which is a little bit of a misnomer since this doesn't really describe something that's very meaningful or long-lived. At any rate, Nikephorus and Charlemagne agreed to open negotiations in 803, but both of them still moved to strengthen their positions in the following years while negotiations continued. Um, during this time, the main bone of contention between the two emperors was that they allowed lots of naval clashes to go down in the Adriatic, and later on the Adriatic would become the settled border between the Byzantine and Frankish worlds. Some scholars actually think that when Michael I ended up recognizing Charlemagne's title, this was actually a confirmation of a decision that had already been reached by Knight Kipharis, and that Michael I was just upholding his father-in-law's decision. But at any rate, the evidence is not 100% clear. One piece of circumstantial evidence that is kind of significant is that the peace was called the Pax Nikephori, even though the emperor who actually finished it and made it stick for good was Leo V, who ended up overthrowing the dynasty that Nikephorus had started. So maybe that is something to consider. But at any rate, uh, this was a long-term process, and it actually involved um, three other emperors in addition to Nikephorus. Nikephorus had two primary objectives for trying to strengthen his hand in the Balkans. One is that gaining more land in the Balkans would be a great deal easier than trying to gain additional territory at the expense of the Abbasids in the east. The second reason is that this would be a good way to try to offset the increasing influence of Charlemagne in eastern and central Europe. So, Nikephorus now had to contend with the situation in the Balkans. For the most part, a lot of the lands that he was interested in were under Slavic control, and most of these Slavic groups had not really formed into states that could put up a great deal of resistance. So as long as Nikephorus was able to organize an army and send it in, he should be able to conquer the area. The main obstacle, therefore, was the First Bulgarian Empire in the north, and this was led by Khan Krum, who had come to power around the year 800 and ruled until his death in 814. Um, now, Krum, for obvious reasons, would not want to see a reassertion of Byzantine authority in the Balkans, since his empire had been born and come to prosperity with the absence of a strong Byzantine presence. Um, Krum was himself a very ambitious ruler, and he pulled off a great achievement in 805 when he finished off the Avar Khaganate and managed to um, grab all of their remaining lands. Krum's empire was the strongest organized opposition to the reassertion of Byzantine authority, and it would be the first Bulgarian empire and Khan Krum who would form the greatest enemies of Nikephorus I and indeed his entire dynasty such as it was. Nikephorus's main achievement as emperor was the military and administrative gains that he was able to make in the Balkans. And his first step was to reconquer the Peloponnese, so he campaigned there first and was able to conquer that area. In due time, he was able to establish six new themes, and these themes were mostly built on existing chunks of territory that he then expanded out and added the hinterlands to. So his new, six new themes were Thrace, Thessalonica, Macedonia, Cephalonia, Dyrrhachium, on the west coast of the Balkans and the Peloponnese in the south. And in order to keep these areas loyal to the empire, what Nikephorus did was to settle loyal groups from elsewhere, 
and used tribes along the frontier who he knew he could count on while removing potentially disloyal groups from these sensitive areas and relocating them to other areas where they could cause less turmoil. Now this population relocations thing is something that um, Roman and Byzantine rulers had been doing for centuries and it looks like Nikephorus was the guy who did it most effectively when compared with any of his predecessors. Archaeological evidence shows that the early 9th century was a time of urban revival in the Balkans and especially in Greece where Nikephorus was most active. So the question becomes um, how much of this newfound prosperity should we attribute to Nikephorus and his policies? And that's not really one that I have a clear answer for at this point. It looks like that the transferred populations from elsewhere served as a catalyst for population recovery over the next couple of centuries. And we also see evidence that for the first time in two centuries since the Slavic migrations that there is imported pottery in the provinces. And in the end it's not 100% clear how much credit for these developments should go to local growth how much should go to imperial policy, and how much should go to general recovery and growth in a time when most of Europe was starting to grow as well. So uh, it's really hard to assess, but it does look like Nikephorus's policies had at least some positive effects on the lives of people living in the western part of the Byzantine Empire. Nikephorus's focus was always on the West and the Balkans, and that is best illustrated by the fact that when he was faced with a major invasion from Caliph Harun al-Rashid, that Nikephorus opted to purchase a peace so that he could continue to keep his armies focused on the West. This decision, in light of what happened later, i.e. the Battle of Pliska, may have created some difficulties for his successors in the East, especially Leo V, who reigned from 813 to 820. The reason I say that it may have created some problems for Leo V is that it seems like he came to power at a time when the empire was threatened on all sides, and that had Nikephorus paid closer attention to the east, that this might not have been an issue. However, all that being said, I think that Nikephorus's decision was the correct one. He made a rational choice. If he could restore the power of the west, then this would give his empire more overall power and the next time he had to clash with the Abbasids he would be on a much firmer footing. So I think that Nikephorus made the correct and rational decision but that it ended up having some unintended consequences that Leo V and others had to deal with. By 811, for reasons which are not entirely clear, Nikephorus and Crum found themselves at war. Now the sources note that Crum was alarmed by Nikephorus' successes, so perhaps he had intervened in some way and managed to attract negative attention of the emperor. It's also simply possible that Nikephorus wanted to restore the Danubian frontier and that the person in his way was Crum. At any rate, at the, in the summer of 811, Nikephorus set out at the head of a large army, which would have numbered around 50 to 80,000 men, and they marched for Bulgaria. Um, early on, Crum realized that he was at a massive disadvantage, and he sent out some peace feelers, which Nikephorus rejected, and then pressed on to the Bulgarian capital of Pliska. Um, Crum and his elite 12,000-man standing army came out to try to defeat this Byzantine force, and they were brushed aside. Crum then levied about 50,000 random troops, and they came out and tried to fight the Byzantines, also were defeated, and after that, um, Nikephorus's men were free to sack Pliska. According to our Byzantine sources, Nikephorus and his men um, committed some real atrocities, and they were pretty brutal, and this apparently hardened Crum's resolve to punish them. So Crum gathered his men, and he began to try to cut off the mountain passes leading back to the south. So Nikephorus became aware of this, and rather than make the march westward that he had been um, anticipating, he decided instead to make a beeline back to the capital. And in the process, he ended up falling into a bit of trouble, as we'll see. As he prepared to withdraw from the vicinity of Pliska, Nikephorus chose to take a road leading through the Varbica Pass.
and for whatever reason he chose not to scout ahead. Perhaps he thought that the Volgars were still too disoriented and disorganized to mount a successful resistance. So he and his army began to march through this narrow pass on their way back home. Crum had correctly assumed that this would be Nikephorus' course of action, and he and his men were in ambush all around the pass. Um, for three days, Crum had Nikephorus trapped, and basically everyone was waiting for the other shoe to drop. After three days, Crum struck at night on July 26, 811, and the result was one of the greatest military disasters in Byzantine history. The Byzantine forces broke almost immediately. In an effort to escape, many men uh, were able to fight their way out of one end of the pass only to be cornered at a river and ended up drowning in it. Um, a lot of other men died trying to work their way over the ramparts that the Bulgarians had erected within the pass itself. Um, during this fighting, many notable figures were killed, and this includes the Emperor Nikephorus himself. Um, the losses during this battle are unknown, but they are known to have been massive, and this is one of the great military catastrophes in history, possibly um, going even beyond just Byzantine history. So let's explore the aftermath of Pliska. So after the battle, the Byzantines did not campaign north of the Danube for 150 years. That should give you a pretty good indication of both the material and psychological impact of this battle. It was enough to also make Krum one of the greatest Bulgarian leaders of all time. Hostile historians say that Nikephorus died on top of a dung heap. I bet that he would have died in a much more glorious fashion had he been willing to persecute Iconoclast. Something tells me that is the case. Anyway, um, after Crum recovered the Emperor's body, he mounted his severed head on a spike, inlaid the skull with silver, and used it at a drink as a drinking cup. Unfortunately, he only had about three more years to enjoy this new prize, as he himself would die in the year 814. Nikephorus' record is checkered, however, there are more credits than debits when we look at his overall legacy. His financial policies, i.e. restoring taxation in the face of elite opposition, and his revival of the Balkans place him in the ranks of the near great emperors just on their own and regardless of any other context. He also stands out as being the first emperor to die in battle since Valens at Adrianople, and also the first and only emperor to become a skull cup. The Balkan territories would be able to sustain the Byzantines following the loss of Asia Minor in the 11th century, so that is his long-term um, contribution. He single-handedly pretty much prolonged the life of the Byzantine Empire and gave it the strength and fortitude to fight another day when trouble would come their way a few centuries later, so that's a pretty big accomplishment to have to your name. However, on the other hand, his fiasco at Pliska was a tremendous stain on his record. The Battle of Pliska opened up a bitter rivalry with the Bulgars, and their importance as imperial adversaries would increase steadily until the time of Basil II. The Nikephoran dynasty, although it produced two more emperors, was effectively over when Nikephorus himself fell dead at Pliska in 811. So had Nikephorus scouted more carefully or um, you know, not taken along almost all of his major officials and potential heirs to the battlefield, then history would have gone quite a bit differently. And in many ways he is responsible for his own downfall and the fact that he is only near great and not truly great is his own fault and it would have been preventable had he only managed to either win at Pliska or simply avoid disaster.